Welcome to the New Trust Economy, where your hosts, Blockchain 101 author and founder of Rise Housing, Monica Profit, and Inc. innovation columnist and brand casting strategist, Tracy Hazard, explore all things blockchain, ICO ventures, and cryptocurrency. Each week, they explore businesses, applications, and venture built on blockchain or cryptocurrency and address issues like women and diversity in tech, trust and distrust, and the economics of access and value. We would like to remind our listeners that investing in disruptive tech, ICOs, and cryptocurrency is speculative in nature and involves substantial risk of loss. We encourage you to invest carefully and do your due diligence first. Now, here are your hosts, Monica Profit and Tracy Hazard. Hi, and welcome to the New Trust Economy. I'm Monica Profit, and I'm here with Neil Takamoto, the founder of Crowdsource Placemaking. Hi, Neil. Thanks so much for joining us. Hi, Monica. Thanks for having me on. So full disclosure, we actually met a couple years ago at a um, social impact SOCAP uh, type of event, and we you know, started talking about real estate and impact way a long time ago. So um, we haven't worked together formally yet, but we actually have been crossing paths and crisscrossing in this space for a while. So it's really nice to have you on the, on the show. Thanks for making the time. Uh, great. I appreciate it. Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. You're doing some really cool work in terms of crowdsourced placemaking, which is its own kind of uh, term to unpack a little bit. But um, if you can tell me a little bit about what crowdsourced placemaking is and um, how you just kind of got involved in it. I know there's something to do with architecture and urban planning, but it's way more robust than that. So can you talk a little bit about how you founded this company? Well, architecture is my degree in, in, in school and um, I had an interest in architecture but it was about placemaking about creating places creating neighborhoods and I always felt like I wanted to do something more impactful and something at a neighborhood scale was something that really appealed to me and so that's where placemaking comes in the crowdsourcing part of it came in when the more I learned about placemaking I, I, it was the built environment that we live in is predominantly created institutionally a lot of the places we have are you know shopping malls subdivisions large office buildings and it's not since the 1920s, 30s, since that we had these walkable human scale neighborhoods that a lot of people actually want to live in and are the most highest um, value per square foot uh, places in the world. So the, a way to sort of accelerate getting places built that people actually wanted, this is where the crowdsourcing part of it came in. So I started to spend more time understanding how can we apply crowdsourcing to placemaking and that's where I'm at right now. Oh, that's great. You know, it makes me think of a friend of mine who I've got to introduce you to. His name is Ivan Shumkov, and he is doing crowdsourced architectural designs. So he runs these, you know, um, kind of like contests for different companies and organizations, including the United Nations. And when they say, you know, we want to do a planned community of this size or in this way, he puts it out and he says, you know, it needs to be pre presented to us with these specs, but the best one's going to win and we're going to implement it. So please, you know, and then anybody who, who knows how to draft and wants to take a stab at it can submit their designs and they'll often get like 2000 different designs for a building or for a community, all from people who, just hear about it and they want to, they say, this is my vision for it. So it's like all the way from architecture to like how people exist in those spaces is, you know, becoming more and more, for lack of a better term, decentralized. Yeah. I mean, it's all about democratizing um, development for people right now. If you walk down your neighborhood, it's, you can identify each building as, as where, who, what developer built it. And there's only a handful of developers that build just about everything in your neighborhood. And we're moving to a system eventually where, People just as where we're shifting towards that in hospitality with Airbnb and transportation with Uber and scooters and bike share, we're going to see that more in real estate development where neighborhoods, residents, um, and people of interest can actually get together and develop collectively, co-invest in their own uh, developments and buildings and developers are become, going to become more like contractors that we see today. Right, like vendors in a way. Like, we just need you to execute on this thing, but we actually are the ones driving the vision of it and the mission of it. Right. I mean, there's no reason why a handful of, the, of business people should be developing the majority of the places that we live in, and play in. And, um, and that's more than self-evident. And, and it's, about, it's, it's great that we're now having systems um, such as um, rise markets that are actually coming to bear that is going to allow people to actually really seriously have a play in 
uh, co-developing their own places. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's kind of where we overlap, right? When you say co-invest, I think, well, the easiest thing I can do is, is make that the money part of that work because every community is going to want to steward their own community differently. So just giving them the tools, putting the pipes in place so they can decide how they want the occupancy and the rents and the ownership and the structures to go. If they're at least like empowered with the ability to determine that, you know, then you actually get to know what do these communities want? Because otherwise it's kind of the assumptions of, I don't know, several, a handful of developers, like you said. And it'll be nice to see them kind of rendered as uh, more vendors than visionaries. <laughs> and then actually the other major benefit of uh, the democratization of uh, real estate development is that you hear a lot of talk about gentrification and the main um, negative about gentrification is that, uh, again, a few developers will come into a neighborhood and develop most of what is new and any profit that's made over depreciation of those buildings goes back to those hand, that handful of developers. And that's the problem with gentrification. Whereas if the community had actually co-developed these buildings together and those buildings increased in desirability and thus property value and they benefit and increase their net worth, that's no longer gentrification, that's revitalization and community wealth building. Exactly, revitalization and community wealth building. So that's really, if, if for lack of a better term, those are two great terms, but that's really what you're going for with, with crowdsource placemaking, right? To see things become reflective and regenerative to the communities that, they are, that they're operating in, right? I mean, it's, things have to be reflecting themselves rather than just reflecting the interests of very few. So I guess that's really where our overlap came with blockchain was like, you know, I, I see that if with, with blockchain, we have the opportunity to create these very powerful financial tools that can truly benefit all in a very equal way that can't be really messed with, right? And they can't, they can't be like, well, if you can't afford a lawyer to enforce your contract, then too bad for you, but this developer can, and they're just going to win in court. You know, it's a, a smart contract kind of takes care of the, some of that stuff. So I think that's where you and I sort of kind of got together, where I was like, I love what you're doing in terms of application. I've got this tool over here that like can really expedite some of that for you. So you keep talking to people and I'm going to give them tools for this stuff. But you've actually, you were talking a little bit about some other tools that um, have a lot to do with community formation right. and governance. And you, I think you, you used a term called um, community Sense-making. flow. Was that right? Yeah. Community flow. So um, when I, when I, you know, interfacing with the, uh, the people who are building these, um, crowdfunding, crowd investment platforms. The one thing they kept saying is that we'd have this beautiful, amazing project that's very community serving. Um, and we'd find conscious development groups and not to, to pull together and build and put this together. And once they put it on the platform to be invested in, they um, have a hard time getting people to trust or to invest or to contribute. And they kept saying, we wish we had a component beforehand where there was a, the committee was able to coalesce and co-create and be part of the shaping of it. So by the time it came to investment, there was a level of trust involved. And, you know, there is, so they don't, they weren't part of the process. Um, And so what I do is actually is involved, is is creating that process where I've uh, helped 10,000 people register across six different communities, seven different communities to actually help develop the master plan for uh, neighborhood revitalization with conscious developers. Oh, where was this project? What's that? Where was the project that you got 10,000 uh, people signed up? These were in Long Island, uh, New Rochelle, um, um, and we had a couple of efforts in New Hampshire and uh, oh, Connecticut. Cool. Okay, cool. So all in the Northeast. Yeah, and also Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Cool. Um, and so, so part of the, uh, what's, what was needed is um, understanding um, where people were at before we even actually started saying, here's what, here's what we're building, let's invest in it. We need to actually understand where they were at, because they, there was even there was a, just a lack of trust that anyone coming in to invest in anything in their neighborhood, thinking that yes, we know what's going to happen. You're going to invest in our neighborhood. You're going to take all the profits, and then we're going to be displaced. So yeah. we're not helping you to you know shape our destiny. Yeah, um, exactly. But uh, it, so there's a new movement around sense making, called something called sense making, which is it, which is around understanding where people are at, giving them the information about where they're at, and you know where where their interests and priorities are. Letting them make sense of that, identifying who the leaders are in terms of like are at the forefront of, say, if we're measuring belonging, who are the people in the, in the neighborhood are just at the forefront of belonging or understanding belonging or really creating belonging in the community. And then we support those, those groups in terms of like, how do we create further belonging? Is it a community center? Is it a recreation center for kids? Are there, are there more events? Do we need places for people to, to gather and together and eat? 
Um, do we need certain kinds of services? Do we need more affordable housing? Right. Affordable housing for, you know, that have certain amenities. So these are the things that we um, help the communities um, become developers for. And then once, once, the, once we understand, people understand where they're psych, uh, psycholo psychologically, emotionally at and what kinds of things they're willing to invest in, and then we help shape the kinds of buildings and, and services that they want to invest in, then the, the question then becomes, well, how do I actually invest? How do I get my friends and family and people who because used to- Because now I've actually had a voice in what I want. Now right, that I right. what I want, yeah. I want to be involved, yeah. right? So rather than the platform or the group saying, would you please invest in this idea we created, the people are then, then asking, now that we have this idea that we created, how can we capitalize it? And that's where these um, platforms come in. Absolutely. That's amazing. So um, in terms of like next steps and what you're doing with Crossroads Placemaking, I know you've been involved with several different groups. You're always doing projects kind of mostly in the Northeast, but also around the country. Are there any really exciting projects that have been capturing your attention lately that you've been highly involved in and some just like some of the milestones that you've been reaching with, with a lot of these tools? Yeah. So it's um, so it really is going to be involved in uh, creating pilots, prototypes or examples of actually applying, say, for instance, fractional ownership and tokenization and um, democratize ownership into a building Yeah, where we've had a conversation with a, with a developer in or a next generation developer who's actually an attorney who's never developed. And that's a good thing. Right. And she's a legal, she just under, understands the legalese behind what it takes to actually create democratized ownership and investment, which in yep. many ways has not been legal or allowed up until recently. Yes. Um, so that's all shifting. Um, so that, you know, there's a development in Michigan. It's a 50,000 square foot building that they're building. I love this scratch. development. I love this yeah. development. I'm so glad you brought it up. Yeah. yeah. It's in it's, Traverse City, right? Right. Yeah. Michigan. It's a 500 member co-op with tenant owners, including nonprofits and affordable housing. So that's one example. And then another example where, as when I was speaking to the um, understanding people, where people are emotionally, psychologically at and allowing them to self-organize, um, we've been talking to them about pioneering this quote sense making or emergence tool. Um, and then we're also pioneering this because it does not exist in the U.S. yet. We're also looking to pioneer this in the Montessori school where, where the students on a daily basis already have this self-organizing mindset. So ah. ways, we're going to pioneer this technology with the kids, teach them how to use it. And then they're actually going to teach the uh, adults in their neighborhood how to use that. And then we actually create a training program out of that. Oh, that's that great. Helps. Yeah. So it, it's about, it's, and then what's really exciting about that is it's, it's a lot of this self-organizing Emergent kind of thinking isn't something we grew up in. We were, we grew up in environments where we were, you know, just taught things in a rote. Yeah. Um, sort of 25 a, of us in a classroom, sometimes 30, yeah. with one teacher yeah. talking to us with a board, Absolutely. and that was supposed to do it. <laughs> so we're so not used to that. We we feel like we need to actually pioneer this with kids, and especially kids that are pioneering education. So I say, as an example, on a Montessori program. Yeah. So this is where we're pioneering that, and then. And where's that? Where's the Montessori program located? That's in uh, Washington D.C. Oh, very cool. That's great. Yeah. And then one, then one group I'm working with, which I'm going to go out on a limb and say, is that there is an organization that, ha that has organized or spun or inspired a crowdsourced city of 70,000 people from scratch in the middle of nowhere. And yeah, it's become I a grand laboratory. That be. <laughs> and that, so that's known as Burning Man. And there's a lot of academics, practitioners, um, people um, pioneering new technologies in terms of co-creation and, um, and democratized participation. Yeah, so we actually go to Burning Man to actually study how this the science of it, and this is the, so I'm working with the people behind that whole uh, initiative and thinking and and mindset to actually further the this uh, movement. That's fantastic. That is so cool. I mean, I just wonder what's going to fall out of something that's already that's already been able to crowdsource a place of seventy thousand people. That's just they're kind of blowing the numbers up to be much bigger than what they've they've been on projects that you've worked on before. So that's really exciting to see. Um, I, I would love to actually bring you back on the show after you have some more updates on what, you know, some, um, on, along the way, how these, these projects are coming to fruition. Because it sounds like it's, as much as you've been at this for a while, it's kind of yeah. early days when it comes to this taking hold and becoming a, a real model for how communities get formed and communities are able to, you know, steward themselves yeah. uh, in the yeah. urban environment as well as, I guess, the suburban environment, right? Absolutely. And then, you know, the, so there's a word we use a lot called the emergence, and it's higher order complexity arising out of chaos and similar in simple interactions it's basically how the human we as humans arrive out of just a group of cells how does that happen it just emerges but if you have the right structure involved you can actually encourage emergence and so um what we're trying to do is create the structures 
to allow that to happen. And this is where we're going to see um, communities revitalize themselves as we give them the framework to allow them to emerge. And this is why the tools for democratized capital is so important is that if those tools are not available, then the fantastic ideas and, and brilliance that they have inherent in their themselves are not going to be allowed to emerge. And so much less emerge collectively in a group in a self-organized way. So again, like just putting the structure up, like putting up the walls or at least the, the beams so people can go, this is what we're going to build and emerge within it. But without those, those structures there, they don't even necessarily know how much agency they could take on. Or the tools. Yeah. Yeah. So one, really what, cool. what, yeah, absolutely. Well, one thing I do want to say is that as far as like um, uh, next steps, um, and this is something you're aware of is, um, so there's a gathering of people that are at the forefront of this emergent thought and we're meeting at Eslan in an event organized by the folks who organized Burning Man. Um, and th these are for people who are actually heavily invested in, in creating these systems from developers to tools, to platforms, to thinkers, to impact investors. And so um, that is open to people who actually share that um, investment mentality and vision. So I um, just want to put that out there. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And there's going to be time for people to hear this and potentially learn more about it. So um, we'll make sure there's a link to that in the show notes below this and people can hopefully see more about it if they want to be involved, if placemaking is, is a big thing to them, or if they just want to see, you know, the opportunities that blockchain can bring to communities. I mean, this is like an actual real life. You're not like running a blockchain company at all. And I interview so many blockchain company CEOs that are, yeah. you know, they, they've done this or that and they've, they understand all those smart contract and they get really deep into technology. And I'm like, can we tell another story maybe just right. so people can relate to you <laughs> and yeah. you, it's like the opposite. You're really just doing community work and you're picking the best tools and you just happen to see like the tool of blockchain has got a really great application and it's just so nice to showcase the work yeah. you're doing and what we're going to be able to enable with technology. Yeah. I mean, our work is dependent on the blockchain technology to work. We know we're not a blockchain company, but in order to do the things we're doing, we need the blockchain technology to actually advance to the point of actually being applicable in day-to-day -day transactions such as um, community investment. Yeah, absolutely. I just, I'm so excited for what the future is going to bring for you. And I can't wait to, you know, of course, watch what happens with your various projects. So we'll bring you back on and I don't know, once, once you've hit some milestones, you say, I'm ready to tell you about this or that and pull the curtain back. I'd love to hear more about your projects. And That's I just, great. I'm so appreciative that you could take the time. Thank you for being on the show and for talking about the communities that you're helping to steward. Um, I just want to make sure that everybody knows if you want to learn more about what Neil's doing, we're going to have all of our links in the show notes below this. So you can check that out. Please um, find him on social. He's all over the place and he's always like pretty much as in my experience, he's always been a really open door to uh, connecting people and helping communities and people just like grow what they, their vision for a better future. So thank you so much, Neil. I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much, Monica. It's been great. Thanks. Yeah. And I guess this is uh, Monica Prophet and Neil Takamoto signing off on the new trust economy. We'll catch you on the next episode. Thanks you guys. You've been listening to The New Trust Economy. We'd love to hear your comments on today's show, as well as suggestions for future topics and guests. Visit us online at newtrusteconomy.com or on social at newtrusteconomy. Thanks for exploring The New Trust Economy with us.